the raising of the remnant. Not the rising of the remnant, the raising of the remnant. There's a difference, and I'll explain that to you in a moment. The raising of the remnant. There's a remnant, right? And we know that God always has his remnant. He always has his remnant, his people that have not bowed their knee to a, to a false god, right? God has his remnant. No matter what scenario, no matter how bad bad looks, there's always a remnant. So there's a remnant. You are part of the remnant. We are part of that remnant. But God is raising up the remnant, our nation is in a time of crisis, and we know this. There's gender confusion, satanic churches on the rise, businesses and Christian schools required to teach diversity and inclusion. It's not just the world. Even Christian schools now, are, some are required. Well, they're all required, but some will follow into this pattern, and, and right as the, as the enemy dictates it, to required to teach diversity and inclusion. We can understand businesses, right? Not that it's good, but we, we get it because they're, they're not based on the word of God. But then when Christian schools are also being told, you have to, you have to teach these little ones diversity and inclusion, our nation is in a time of crisis. Not only is our nation in a time of crisis, but so is a lot of the church. Many in the church are falling away, and I just recently preached a message about that, you know, and it's something that, that isn't always the easiest to talk about or hear, but does need to be spoken as the Holy Spirit directs. You know, well-known pastors living in compromised lives, and then congregations of people afraid to speak up to truth, right? Instead, they, they remain voiceless. They remain voiceless and they justify poor behavior because they have forgotten their first love. God is raising us up as his remnant. And the reason that he is doing this is because there is a lot of corruption in many of the churches. It cannot be, and it cannot be overlooked. And, you, and it cannot become what is commonplace in your life, right? In any of your lives. So their flesh leads them to follow after a man or a woman of charisma instead of the son of man which gave his life for us. Never keep your eyes, never put your eyes nor keep your eyes on the, the man or the woman in the pulpit. Never idolize. Do not idolize me. Do not idolize whomever God is using because that right there is idolatry. And this sets up such a great falling away. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. So the Lord has spoken and he said the raising up of the remnant. Not, not the rising, the raising. Okay. The, God's people are scattered abroad and they are waiting to be raised up. Instructed. They need to be instructed to, be, to literally raise, to, be, to rise up. Right? To be the army here on earth. So if the remnant need to be instructed to rise up, then God says, I want to raise up those remnant that have been waiting, that have been believing, they have been steadfast, steadfast in prayer, steadfast in, in fasting. They've been steadfast in keeping their hearts pure and separate from the, the tainting of the world. Right? We keep our lives hidden in Christ, and keep the secret place first and foremost always, first place in our heart, right? So critical that we do this. So God is raising up the remnant. There's always a remnant, and they're scattered abroad. But he's saying, I'm going to raise them up. I'm going to raise them up to walk in purity, to walk in power, and to have a voice. To have a voice. You're not voiceless. You're not speechless. You're not mute, but many in the church are because they've been deceived, because they look at a, at a, a, at a gift, character, right? Instead of character. They look at the gift instead of, instead of character. So we're going to live righteously. We're going to live righteously in true repentance and in godly integrity because we're called to be kings and priests. We're called to be kings and priests that God can trust. Can he trust you? To be kings and priests. So in so doing, in, in this, what God has spoken to me, raise up the remnant. He said, raise up the remnant. In doing so, we are going to embark on a journey to study the life of 
Samuel. And so if you, if you want, you know, in your own time, go forth and read First and Second Samuel because you're going to get a lot more out of the, you know, the studies in the next few weeks if you have recently read First and Second Samuel. So I want to lay a foundation where the remnant are going to literally be raised up to live in God's covenant. There's a covenant. He's a covenant keeping God, right? And covenant, covenant keeping God, a covenant keeping God wants a holy people, a people that understand the holiness of God and that they're not going to, they're not going to diminish the gifts. We're, we're not going to diminish the gifts, but we're going to walk properly, putting everything in their right order. Amen? And so most likely in the daily studies that I do on, on Facebook, I'm going to also be you know, speaking about this same thing in First and Second Samuel. So there will be lots of opportunities for you to get the heart of God in, in what I'm referring to. Amen? So there are, there are many that compromise, and they're afraid to say no. But God says, I want you to have boldness to say no when no is the right response instead of being a yes man and following into people pleasing. Oh, that's a big one, church. People pleasing, fear of man. But that's not going to be you because God, that's not God, is not his Holy Spirit at all. So God's will does not change. We know this. God's will does not change. Exodus 19.5. This is when Moses uh, was on Mount Sinai, and the Lord gave unto him, right, the, the law, the commandments. And it says in verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, following God is not that hard when we just obey what he says. Obey his voice, hear his voice, and then obey it. So if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, he's a covenant-keeping God. He wants you to be a covenant-keeping person. He says, then you shall be a special treasure to me and all, the peop and, and all the people, for all the earth is mine. The earth is the Lord's. And you shall be unto me, verse 6, a kingdom of priests. This is a promise. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. In other words, you are here walking on the face of this earth, but your kingdom is from another kingdom, and you belong to the kingdom of God, and you're going to be a, a, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. God is looking for a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. God's word will not change. It remains the same. Amen. Amen. Now I want to back up. I'm going to start in verse 3. Same chapter, verse 19. Moses went up to God. Right there. What do we do? We go up. We pray. We go into the secret place. Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain. And he said, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and to tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. He's saying, this is what I want you to speak. This is what's already happened. We have so many testimonies of what God has already done in, the, in your, every single one of us do, right? You have seen what I did. What did he do in your own life? I, I, all of you. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you up on wings, uh, on eagle's wings. Literally, he, 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 caught, he pulled you out of the pit. How many times? Too numerous uh, times to count. Too many times. And he says, now, again, verse 6, if you will indeed obey my voice. So there's something to be said about remembering what God has already done. There's something to be said about speaking it out loud, testifying of the goodness of the Lord, right? And then remember, I will obey the voice of the Lord. I will heed the voice, and I will listen to that voice, and I will keep his covenant no matter what. You are his treasured people. You are, his, you are a treasure, a special people. And you are kingdom priests. Kingdom of priests. Glory to God. So here we see a promise. He gave this promise to Moses, didn't he? He gave this promise to Moses. He also is giving us this promise. He's giving you this promise. He's giving you this promise. You're going to walk holy and you're going to be a kingdom of priests. How is this done? Well, what does the Lord require? Because there is a requirement. And, and let's turn to Deuteronomy 10. Let's read the requirements. I'm going to start with 12 and, 13, 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? 
but to fear the Lord your God. Thank you, Father, for the fear of God. Thank you for the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. So, but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all of his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord, his statutes, which I command for you today for your, for your good. So he's saying here, fear the Lord. Number one, fear the Lord. He says here, walk in his ways. He wants us to fear the Lord. He wants us to walk in his ways. He's saying, love the Lord, your God, with everything within you. He says, serve the Lord, your God, with everything within you. And keep his commandments. If you're going to walk as one that has been crowned with abundance, if you're going to walk as the remnant that God has chosen to speak truth in this generation where there are so many that are in the crisis mode, including in the church. If you're going to walk as a kingdom of priests, school of the prophets, where God is raising up those with a voice that, not just your voice, it's the voice of God. Let's get that right. It's the voice of God that you will be speaking because you're literally being undergirded by the Holy Spirit as you are, uh, as the word is, is, is your foundation. Right? Amen? So this is what he is saying. There's a requirement. He says, there's a requirement for every single one of us. Because I do believe that I, am, I preach to, to a congregation that they're serious. They're serious for, for the Lord. Most are really not baby Christians. You know, most are uh, much more mature in their walk. And they're really pressing in for the pure gold of the heart of God, which they understand that that means a stripping away of everything that they thought they wanted, everything that is not of God, everything that has to do with the flesh, right, soul? So in order for us to walk in this together in a corporate level, we have to all understand that God has crowned you. This is the prize. This is the, the end goal. He's crowned you with abundance, but don't think for a moment you're going to be able to hang on to what God has given unless you know how to walk holy before him. And so we got to walk holy before him. And we just laid down some of the requirements, right? There's one verse where God was calling his people to repent. In Zechariah 1.3, thus saith the Lord of hosts, return to me and I will return to you. It's calling people to repentance. Return to me and I will return to you. To, to repent is to return to the Lord. It's to stop doing whatever you're doing sin-wise and, and go the other way, right? It's to stop behaving in a sinful pattern and to start living right, to truly repent. It's to return to a relationship with God. We all can deepen our relationship with God, every single one of us. So true revival is when God's people repent of sin and begin to live right. People talk about revival so much. We want revival. We want revival. But the problem is, is they define revival in a way that's actually not true. See, today people think that if deliverance is taking place, there's revival. That's not revival. That's deliverance. Okay, that's people getting delivered of demons. Happens here all the time. It should happen in your walk and in your life every day. It should happen all the time right? Deliverance, people getting set free. But it's not necessarily revival because I think most of you have been around enough to know that there are people that get delivered and give it a week or two and they're right back in the same old, same old. Same demon came back in and probably more, seven more. More deceived than before, Right? They didn't carry out that deliverance, so yet it was called revival, but how long was that revival? Because it wasn't revival. It was deliverance. It has its time and it has its place. But see, people phrase certain things wrongly, like worship. There'll be a worship service. It's powerful, on fire. People are just, their hearts are being stirred. They're in worship. They love God. They're expressing their heart for God, and they call it revival. Right? But revival has to do with repentance. And without repentance, there's no refreshing. Acts chapter 3. 
I believe it's 19. It says, repent of your sins. So refreshing, revival, may come from God. You, those that know me know I'm not bashing deliverance nor am I bashing worship. My goodness, I operate in both. <laughs> deliverance all the time. We would love to worship. I'm just saying, as the church of God, we cannot say, look, it's revival. It's worship, which it should be. We're giving our all to Jesus. It should be. It's deliverance. People are getting set free from demonic powers and principalities. Praise God for that. Can these two things lead to revival? Absolutely. Of course it can lead to revival. When your heart is genuinely, truly broken because you've broken the heart of God. When your heart is sorrowful for sinning against God, then there's re true repentance. But then that's where revival can start to spring forth. And that does happen many times. Somebody will be on a worship service or in a deliverance, you know, time. And, and wow, those demons were purged from them. Their hearts were stirred in worship. And they genuinely, because only God knows your heart, literally in the heart, in the depths of who they are, they repented. They repented. Maybe nobody led them in a prayer of repentance and forgiveness, but they repented. And they walked differently. And that happens. And it's beautiful when it happens. It's great. God's good. He's merciful. He's great. He's going to work however he wants to work. I'm just saying, as a mature church, we have to be careful that we don't mislabel things. They have their own place. Deliverance has its place. Worship has its place. And, and they lead to so much. But in order for true revival to come about, there has to be true repentance. There has to be people that truly give their lives to Jesus, and the old ways have to be repented of. When your heart breaks for the things of God, when your heart yearns because you know you have grieved the Spirit of God, that's when there's a genuine turning, a genuine repenting, a turning of old ways. That's where revival comes forth from because it's like there's an increase now of the refreshing of God. You know, because there's many people that will sing it during a worship service. Sing unto the Lord a new song. They'll sing. They'll sing. It's beautiful. But they walk out with the same mindset. They walk out with the same bondage. They walk out with the same struggles. We can't be, oh, that was just a, that was a feel-good moment. God wants your life. He wants all of your lives. He wants your surrender. Not just when you sang that one song, but you walked out and you started to act just like you used to act when you come before the Lord. Because, like I said, God is raising up the remnant. In order to raise up the remnant, he's got to be able to trust you with more. Do you think he's going to give you more if he can't trust you with more? No. But he wants to give you more. So that means he wants to create in us that heart that is ready for more. So we have to be able to rightly judge. Well, that's deliverance. Praise God. And we pray that it leads to a genuine repentance and revival. Well, that's worship. Praise God. And we pray that it leads to a genuine, you know, turning of lives and lifestyles and commitments to God. And not just for the moment. Right? When we come before the Lord, we prepare our hearts. We ask God to cleanse us. We really should be doing this all the time. Not just when we come to church. We should be doing this on a daily basis. Lord, I repent, forgive me of my sins. In any area that I have grieved your heart, forgive me, I repent. I don't want to walk like that, forgive me. Lord, quicken me by the Holy Spirit that I would walk so sensitively to you that I would become someone that you can trust with more. Mature in him. Because if I'm going to wear a crown of righteousness, which we all have, but if I'm going to wear that crown and, and it's going to be, and, and where God is increasing authority and responsibility, then I, I'm not planning on midway, halfway through the year, falling, you know, in some way because I didn't have my foundation right. I started this message with saying there are many that are falling away in the church. You know, moral corruption, there are all kinds of different, you know, things that are happening out there that are not at all good. It doesn't have, it shouldn't be that way, you guys. Amen. It abs absolutely should not be that way, right. but it is. It's beyond saddening. My point is, is that it's a choice. Your lives, every day, what you do, it's about a choice. Yeah. Whom are you going to serve today? 
How are you going to serve the Lord today? Are you going to serve the Lord with, with purity? Are you going to serve the Lord with your whole heart today? Because if you think that you're better than someone else, if you think that you have arrived, if you think, oh, I don't need to hear this, I'm beyond that, that's the area that you're going to fall. Every day we need to make sure that we keep our, our lives hidden in Christ. And asking for his mercy and his favor and his wisdom Amen. to be deposited on the inside of us. See, people get a little too puffed up, especially if they're holding a mic. And that's terrible. They get too puffed up. They think that they have arrived. They think that, oh, they've, they've got this going. They've got that charisma going. People see the gifting. Yes, but God sees the heart. And when you don't stop and repent genuinely, Everyone then will see the heart because things become exposed, which is what's happening right now. And the grievous part is, is that the world looks at the church and mocks. See? They didn't want to go to church anyway. See? They just proved there. It's, it's all, it's just all like uh, hypocrites. They're hypocrites. No, they're not all hypocrites. There are some, but not a genuine, true Christian that walks in the love of God that's genuinely received Jesus and now walks with the heart of repentance and true revival every single day. You don't have to wait for there to be a crowd of people that say, this is revival. Revival should be within your heart. Revival should be the fire of God that you carry. Revival should be that which you carry, which is God's love that you can't help but keep on pressing in to the, to the love of God. There should be an internal fire that continually rises up. And if you go, but I don't have that. Well, then put yourself in places like this where you do see the presence of God, where you will receive even more. And we are not the only place. Do not think that I am trying to say that, that you were so elite that this is the only place. No. But I do believe you have to be very careful because I think there are a lot of people that pose themselves to be pure and holy and they're not so you gotta have wisdom and discernment you gotta hear the holy spirit well we hear god as we walk as pure vessels that don't walk polluted because daily we say lord search my heart let me have clean hands and a pure heart when we search when we let god search our hearts we will hear his voice better more clear So God is looking for his remnant, his remnant to step up. Hallelujah. So the call for repentance for God's people must always remain true. And to, you know, a lot of people only want to preach about repentance. They're like, ah, oh, sin and repentance. Guys, that's the most beautiful thing you can ever preach. When you preach Jesus, when you preach the cross, when you preach the blood of Jesus, you you. You preach genuine uh, repentance of sin. There's no better message, you guys. Because it genuinely will turn your lives around to serve the one and only true God. The mark of God being upon your life and God's favor. So the call for repentance must always remain the same. Whether, whether someone's standing up here preaching it or not, it should be something that you live out daily because it's now part of your walk. I want to live in a place of repentance. Remember in the book of Job, when all those things started to happen to Job? Lost his children, he, he, you know, all these boils and sores and financial loss and everything, right? And, and the continual, you know, blaming and the continual, you know, and then the friends, the, the, the friends that were like Job's friends, right? They really didn't help him much, and, you know, this is wrong and that's wrong. But, but Job spoke of things that he did not know. Job, which was very beaten down, horrifically, just so many things taken and stolen from him. Yeah, terrible, it's horrible. But if Job would have lived a life of repentance, if Job would not have allowed uh, pride to creep into his heart, if Job would not have allowed his heart to think he knew what should have happened, which is pride, it wouldn't have turned out like that for him. 
when he forgave, when he blessed his enemies, then God restored. Pride was his downfall. See, a lot of people don't preach that. They go, whoa, poor Job. But at least God restored. There's no poor Job. There's no poor Job here. Job was walking in pride. That's not poor Job. Years ago, when the Lord gave me a dream, and this is a long time ago, and in my dream, the enemy went to the Lord, and he literally went to the throne. And, and I remember this is a dream now. And he said, you know, what about Kathy? Sure, she loves you. Sure, she serves you. But just mess everything up. Destroy everything that's important to her. And let's see if she worships you. Let's see if she loves you then. And I woke up. I already understood at that point in my walk about the story of Job and how he was filled with pride. And that was his downfall. And if it wasn't for the mercy of God, yes, he, yes, he repented. He said, I spoke of things I did not know. He spoke of things, blabbing at the mouth, things he did not know, but acted like he did. It's pride. He says, but now I repent. You read it. It's at the end of Job. But now I repent. Job repented. And then God blessed because he blessed and his, friend, his uh, enemies and prayed for them and blessed them. So I have this dream, and, I'm, and I know the story of Job. And I woke up from the dream, and I said, Lord, thank you for this prophetic dream. Thank you for the heads up. I don't know what's ahead, but clearly something is planned. It's not good. But I do know this one thing. I will live in a place of repentance daily. Because if you think you, in and of yourself, can overcome whatever demonic warfare is sent your way, you're walking down a path of pride. And destruction is sure to follow. It's where a lot of people are, a lot of ministers are, in a path of pride. They know how to preach like nobody's business. They, they know how to act. They know how to move in the spirit. But the glory of God has departed from their house because they have not walked in a place of repentance daily. Sure enough, I think it was the very next day. It was very soon. Like the story of Job, one thing after the next, one thing after the next, one thing after the next, and that began years, and I mean years, of catastrophe, of which I'm not getting into. But I will let you know that the Lord is faithful. I will let you know that what he said to me, what I already understood about Job, and what I said to him, I will live in a place of continual repentance. God was merciful. God equipped me trained me up, raised me up to be able to fight battles that at the time I was unaware of. But that all started to come very clear, very clear. I say this to say repentance is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's actually the best thing to literally walk in a place of repentance. Repenting for what? Repent of sin, your own. Yes, someone else's. Yes, you can stand in the gap. Stand in the gap until they do. Stand in the gap until they repent. Stand in the gap on their behalf until they come to their senses and pray and ask for forgiveness. Repent. And don't let the enemy bring pride because that would surely be your, your downfall. So the message that God wants to raise up this remnant the message that God has placed a crown on your head to, to literally cause you to walk in abundance, and he says, I've crowned this year with abundance? Don't think for one minute the enemy isn't trying to plan some scheme of pride to knock that crown off and to literally take you down to size. How do you walk? How do you maintain what God is trying to give? 
Walk in a place of repentance. Walk in a place of purity. Understand, the enemy has nothing on you when you walk holy. He does have something on you when you don't. Because you've given him access, not God. It's not always easy to do. And he knows, he knows our weakness. He knows, he knows what to, how, how to send assignments so that we're hurt in our emotions. And then our emotions rise up and react and respond in a way that's not God, but in a way that enables the enemy. Oh, can I ever talk about this? <laughs> but only with what God would, would allow to help people to walk in the high calling of God. So we always want to make sure that we live our lives for an audience of one. Because God is watching. And he knows. And he hears. And he sees. He sees it all. Church, he sees it all. So today we've got many that take on his name, but not his nature. You cannot be a true Christian if you take on the name of Jesus, but not the nature of Christ. That's not called Christianity. That's, that's, that's a God of your own making. If you're going to walk with Christ, you, you take on the name of Christ when you, Christ-like, Christian, you take on the name of Christ, but it's the nature of Christ that we need to take on. Amen. The nature of Christ that we need to start seeing. The nature of Christ when it's hard, when it's difficult, yes. that you don't react in the same old way. You will be tested in this. That's right. You will be tested in this. God wants to increase your authority, but you will be tested in this. He wants to increase your ability to walk with that crown, with the ability to, to have that voice, the remnant being raised up, but you will be tested in this. I mean, why else? You know, Matthew 7, 21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the word says, depart. I never knew you. Depart. You who practice lawlessness. But they were casting out demons. They were doing miracles. You who practice lawlessness. What is purely from the heart is what God sees. And what is purely from the heart with right, genuine integrity doing for an audience of one, that is where God will bless. Eventually, you'll see the fruit. You go, but I've been doing that. I don't see the fruit. You keep on keeping on and make sure your heart is to serve him and all glory goes unto him and not yourself Amen. or anyone else. So we're going to build our house on the rock. We are the remnant, and we're, and we're standing strong, yes, in a godless society. Yes, with crisis all around us, but we're still standing strong. And for some, it's right in your own homes. It's okay. You're still going to stand strong. When it was right in my own home for years, God used, well, he deposited his strength so that I would not fall. Well, don't you think he's going to do the same if you cry out to him? Of course. Of course. So we will return to our first love if you have to return. And again, for some of you go, I don't have to return. I'm still there. Praise God. Praise God. But for some that need to return to their first love, do it. Father, forgive me. I want to start this year off right. I want to start this year off right. I want to start this year right in the center of your will. I want to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Your word says, everything else will be added unto me in Matthew 6, I want to seek first, Lord. First, seek first the living God, the kingdom of God. So 1 Samuel 2 and 35. And this is the only verse today that, we're gonna, that I'm going to mention about, about Samuel. But we're going to get into this, the life of Samuel in the preceding messages. So 1 Samuel 2, 35. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, this is what God is doing, who shall do according to what is in my heart and my mind. God has a plan. He has a plan. And he will do according to what is in his heart and in his mind. 
This is, I will build a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. This is 1 Samuel 2.35. You might say, yeah, but this is talking about Samuel. This is Eli, and God is still speaking to you, and he uses his word to do so all the time. So Samuel, you know, ministered before the Lord. He laid down in the presence of the Lord where the ark of God was. He was trained up under Eli, right? He was trained up under Eli, the priest, to minister before the Lord. So the best thing you can do is to develop your heart of ministering before the Lord and not just for a 30-minute devotional, but secure your heart for a 24 continual heart of worship. Anchor your heart with him. Literally anchor yourself in the love of God. It's a choice and it's something that you intentionally do. No, I'm not going to partake of that conversation. Why? Because I'm going to anchor my heart in the love of God. No, I'm not going to go with that group of people. Why? Well, I love them and I pray for them. I'm not like, but I'm going to anchor myself in the love of God. No, I'm not going to be a part of that group and that group. Yeah, there's some good. There's a lot of deception because I'm going to anchor myself with the word of God, the love of God. Father, you have said in your word that you are crowning us this year. You're crowning this year with your goodness and with your abundance, according to your word in Psalm 65, 11. You've also said that you're raising up the remnant and that as they're being raised up, They'll understand positions and authority and places of service that you've called them to, a kingdom of priests that know how to worship God, that know how to minister to God first before they try to minister to somebody else. So, Father, I thank you for what you are doing. Shine your search light within us. That in any place, in any area of our lives where there needs to be repentance, we would, we would be the first to say, Lord, forgive me, I repent. I walk in a position of repentance daily. Let that be our prayer, God. Let that be our hearts. Because we want to serve you and we don't want, we, are, we refuse to become a mockery. We refuse to live a sloppy Christian life where mockery is sure to come. No, the most precious gift, which is Christ in us that has been given to us, we will literally tend to the Spirit of God who directs our steps. And we will not shun the Holy Spirit when he speaks. We will continue to hear his voice, be sensitive to what he is saying, and do what he is telling us to do, so that our lives will represent him well. Amen. And that's the reason, that's the motive. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give God the glory.